Wake up, it's mind pump time. Hey, today's episode was really fun. Look, sleep is super important for your health, but we've heard it time and time again. Reduce your blue light exposure, make sure your room is cool, don't eat before bed, blah, 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 blah. Well, in today's episode, we brought Dr. Michael Ruscio, one of our favorite functional medicine practitioners, to talk about some weird tricks that are inexpensive, easy to use, that should improve most people sleep. It's a great episode. Also, a giveaway. That's what we do on every single episode here on YouTube. Today's giveaway is awesome because it's MAPS Anabolic, the most popular MAPS workout program. Great for building muscle, building strength, speeding up your metabolism, and just generally making you look hot and sexy. So today's giveaway, MAPS Anabolic, here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Also, subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, you get free access to MAPS Anabolic. One more thing before we start the podcast. Two workout programs are on sale right now. MAPS Performance, MAPS Suspension. Both 50% off. Go find them at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code SEPTEMBER50. That's SEPTEMBER50 with no space for that discount. All right? Enjoy the show. Dr. Ruscio, always good to have you on the show. One of our favorite uh, functional medicine uh, practitioners. So um, we wanted to talk about, or you said you want to talk a little bit about sleep with us, which sleep is, I would say it's probably one of the most important things that can make or break your health. Obviously, if you have poor sleep, you can have the best diet and exercise uh, and other aspects and you're just, your health is going to go. Strongly agreed. Yeah, it's going to totally go yeah. to crap. And one of the things that is interesting with sleep that I've learned, and I'd love your input on this, is that we're humans are pretty good at getting by with suboptimal sleep, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we should. In other words, we could drink caffeine. We can like still kind of, it's almost like we're functional alcoholics. Like we could do stuff <laughs> and we get away with it and we do it for so long that we don't realize just how much, uh, you know, how bad yeah. it is for our health. I mean, would you say that that's kind of a, a true statement for you? Yeah, it's it's totally fair. And this is something that I kind of dragged my feet on myself, which was, ah, I can go to bed at 12. It won't be that big of a deal until you're consistently getting to bed, maybe at 1030. And then you're noticing, huh, that midday lull where it's like an hour of the day where it's kind of hard to get through. And I, you know, it's harder to think. I want to take a break. I want to have a coffee. I think a lot of us hit that between maybe 12 and two-ish. There's mm -hmm. that little midday slump. That doesn't exist if I sleep well. And I'm just laser like focused mm -hmm. all day. And I don't kind of wave my hands when it comes to going to the gym. I just go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you need that like a 20 minute kind of play some music, get myself up. If you've slept well, in my experience, most of the time you're just pff, all day focused, all day disciplined. And the the subtle nuances in sleep, kind of like you're alluding to, they're not super obvious. It could just be an hour between you know when you normally go to bed or when you go to bed at an optimized time. But there's this other layer, because I think most of us have heard, don't eat too close to bed, don't exercise too close to bed, don't have blue light before bed, or wear your glasses, or use your filters. And all those things, check, 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 are true. But there's another layer beyond that, which we've been experimenting with at the clinic, which is suboptimal respiration while sleeping. And So you're going to bed on time. I, I get my eight hours, but it's the quality within that period of time. It's a quality of breathing. So you have a strong neck, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You guys all have strong necks. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm not going to pick a fight with anyone mm -hmm. here because it's pretty, pretty big room, right? You'd lose. But that, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm out my head that actually is a impediment to sleep because those muscles, as they grow, they occlude the airway. Yeah, I've heard mm -hmm. this. Right. Yeah. So this is fairly common knowledge. And, and what I think is being missed is that men have about double the snoring prevalence that women do. And snoring is a red flag for some type of apnea or some type of sub optimum respiration quality. Hmm. Why I think many people don't look into this is they say, well, I don't want to do a CPAP. That sounds torturous. Right. But there's a big chasm of stuff you can do without having to do CPAP. And this is where I think conventional medicine has been a bit lazy in that it's like, well, do you have crippling fatigue, high blood pressure and brain fog? Then we'll do an apnea test. And if you have apnea, we'll give you a CPAP. But just as one example, using you know this, this one thing, this is a positional change device. It's, it's a little magnet that you put on your back 
and it prevents you from sleeping on your back, people tend to snore less and have less apnea episodes when they sleep on their sides. So this $15 device is one thing that you could try. So it just prevents you, you go to lay on your back. You now, I've heard it. of people doing that with like a tennis ball. Is it like the same thing? Same thing. So what's yeah. the difference with, with the magnet? Why, why I the mean, magnet? this just might be a little easier where you can stick it on your shirt and then put your shirt on. You can change oh, out your shirt. Oh, God. You don't have to tape oh, it. Okay, that's clever. So it's not rolling around yeah, all over the place. You know, with you. before oh, we get into these devices, because I see you brought a bunch of what seemed to be most of them inexpensive devices. I thought I they were sex to toys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't be a bad Anytime Ruc Adam sees Ruscio is the type of guy that would carry a bunch of sex toys with him wherever he goes. Pulled out the wrong one. No, I want to get into this because as we were talking off air, some of the stuff I didn't even consider. But before we do, I want to talk about the the subtle health effects yes. of suboptimal sleep because I think we all know, I'll tell you what, I, I experienced this uh, just just through my wife because, okay, we have a baby, right? So a 10-month-old baby, and he's still got some challenging sleep issues. But as you know, in those early months, that's probably the most sleep-deprived you'll ever be in your entire life. Absolutely. It's just, it's a lot of, it's crazy. Watching my wife's mental state literally deteriorate through that process where she didn't remember things, her personality changed. It's It was extreme, right? And I've sure. experienced sleep deprivation to where it does that. But most of us don't get that level all the time. It's much more subtle. We might not notice, and but I'd like to talk about the effects. Personally for myself, what I notice, and this is only because I podcast and do you know YouTube on a regular basis, I wouldn't have even noticed this had I not done this for a living. My verbal fluency drops hundred percent i am i can't recall words as quickly i'm not as sharp i'm not as whatever i can't perform as well charisma whatever you want to call it i notice a 10 percent decrease in that and i'm only paying attention because i do this show if i had a desk job i don't think i would have noticed what are some of the the effects that just you know kind of low levels of consistent poor sleep can have on our bodies and it's such an important point that you raise because we want to flag these symptoms for people. And cognition is definitely one. It could be brain fog. It could be word search. It could be short-term memory as your wife experienced. And it could also be just lability of mood, meaning people are more depressive, more anxious. For some people, they skew toward anxiety. For some people, it's depression. And that midday slump, I think, is kind of a, a, a precursor to depression, right? If people get tired enough, it's this kind of fatigue depression where mm. everything feels like a chore, Right, you get a text with, "Oh, you got to pick up our child from daycare early," and it's like oh, it feels crushing to you, right? Because you don't have the energy just to run through it and get it done. Cognition is a big one. Fatigue is another big one, and that just could be subtle fatigue. But you shouldn't feel tired in the middle of the day, right? There, there shouldn't be a stretch where it feels hard just to live or to do stuff. There should be an even keel of energy. And so, if you're having that, Ugh, I don't feel like working. I don't feel like working out. I don't feel like doing this. That's a flag that there could be something that's problematic with sleep. No, sure. Like we're all human. We're going to have a day here and there. But if it's consistent. Yeah, if it's fairly consistent. High blood pressure is actually another one that Interesting. Is, has been correlated. Now, with is this sleep. because you're, you're trying to offset or at least your body's – you're like giving your body signals, I need to stay awake. Therefore, I'm creating stress. Catecholamine production goes up, increases uh, blood pressure kind of as a side effect of the fact that you're trying to offset being tired. Yeah, I mean, that could definitely be one mechanism. There's also evidence that has shown when people sleep poorly, they make more poor food choices. So it could be people eat higher glycemic foods. Adam talks about that all the time. All the time. I always notice whenever whenever I have like a really poor night's sleep, I also have the most random like craving. greasy fast yeah. food type of yep. a craving. Looking for the it. serotonin dopamine fix or yep. whatever to, yep. make you, to kind of medicate. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Now, uh, what about uh, inflammation or... Gut health, this is an issue that I on and off deal with. Do, do we notice effects on, uh, like, for example, gut health and digestion from poor sleep? Yeah, you know, when I was writing Healthy Gut Healthy You, we, we did a whole review of the evidence on sleep. And it was pretty amazing to see every facet of health that's been studied as it pertains to sleep gets worse when sleep quality or timing is interrupted. Everything. Everything that we researched from heart disease to cancer to cognitive decline to high blood pressure to IBS to IBD, everything. And, and usually there was a meta-analysis, meaning a summary of clinical trials that substantiated whether it which be- Which is the gold standard, right? Yeah, That's which is the highest level of scientific evidence. So it's, you know, to your earlier point, if you're talking about two or three of the most important levers for your health, 
diet, exercise, and sleep are going to be the top three. And I think sleep might actually be the most important. Honestly, yeah. I think so. What is what? I mean, since you're you're getting people in the clinic all the time, and you and you guys have so many patients that you can assess this with. What does the order of operation look like for you? Like, how does that? I'm yes. a patient. I call you. I'm like, so th this is so key, right? Because this wasn't this isn't my primary area. My primary area is GI, and I was noticing that my aura ring, uh, a tracking wedding band like uh, sleep device, I was like a at best a B plus sleeper kind of gives you like a score, like mm -hmm. hundreds, the best. Yeah. And I was also in between C minus and B plus, but I'm saying to myself, geez, I have to live like a nun or a monk to get like a B plus. Maybe there's something going on with my respiration quality that's limiting my sleep. Well, so pause there for a second. Okay. What were you doing? What did you have to do before? Because you weren't looking at respiration quality before is what you're saying. What were the things you had to do before that had to be perfect before yeah. you even paid attention well, to that? Well, so I was eating too late, I was exercising too late, and I was going to bed a little bit later than I should. Okay. So I kind of had this rhythm. And this this is where the, the biometric tracking devices, I think, have a lot of merit. They help you see the patterns that aren't serving you. Mm -hmm. So I'd work all day, and then I'd go to the gym maybe for 6.30, get home maybe 7.45, then I'd go in my sauna, wouldn't get out of the sauna until 8.15, and then best case scenario... I'm done eating at 9.15 and I'm trying to go to bed at like 11, 11.30. Mm. And that was just too much kind of consolidation of stimulation and eating too close to the bed window. Got it. So now I go to the gym during lunch and I'll go in the sauna at the end of my day at maybe six and I'll have my meal at seven and be done eating maybe 7.30 and get to bed at 10.30. So it was just shifting some of those things. It wasn't too hard to do, but I needed the awareness to your earlier point because it wasn't super obvious. I wasn't debilitatingly fatigued yeah, that's from really doing stuff, this, yeah. but I was noticing that my word recall and that kind of capaciousness of your vocabulary was a little bit more shrunken down. Mm -hmm. And I'd hear maybe an interesting word or thought, but then three days later, I'd be like, oh, what was that thing? Yes. Right? That's but, the best now, way I can explain but, but it. But now it's like, oh, there it is. Yes. I'll, I'll find myself having conversations with the guys on the show and there'll be a word that I want to use. Yes, and you I'm can't like, grasp it. I, you can't retrieve and it. I have to use like a dumber sounding word <laughs> to describe it. And I was like, why couldn't I get that word out? Yeah. And that's exactly what I noticed. Yep. Yeah. So that's pretty wild. And so it was those, yeah, it was those sorts of things I started to notice. Um, but here's to your question of order of operations. Yeah, yeah. This is something that I think conventional medicine does well in the realm of conventional medicine meaning, you know, colorectal cancer screenings, heart attack screenings. They, they do well for shunting you into that and they have a good order of operations. In integrative and alternative medicine, that hasn't been developed. So it's kind of like the Wild West. And as I started going out and, and doing consults with different either orthodontists or dentists or physicians in sleep medicine, it was absolutely crazy. The, one of the first consultants that I saw said, you need to have your face cracked open to have mandula, uh, mandibular maxillary advancement surgery to open up your airway. That's a huge intervention. That's huge just... intervention. And juxtapose that with there are meta-analyses, so summaries of clinical trials that have found that what's, what's known as myofunctional therapy, which is essentially physical therapy for your palate, for your tongue and your throat to tonify those muscles, is as effective as CPAP. So I was being told to go be, you know, beyond even CPAP and go to a surgery where they literally crack your face open. It's like three months to recover. And there was never a mention of, well, here's our baseline test. You're showing some moderate drops in your oxygen levels. Let's have you do four weeks on myofunctional therapy, reassess the test, reassess your, your symptoms. And then if you're feeling better, great. If not, we can escalate. And this is kind of to your point. There needs to be an intelligent order of operations. And oftentimes in integrative healthcare, there's not. Yeah. yeah. So again, let me pause you there because I want to emphasize this. As trainers, when you would get a client who's obese, wants to lose weight, there's, it's usually not one thing that's contributing uh, to this issue. There's lots and lots of things that are contributing. And one mistake that new trainers make all the time mm -hmm is they throw everything but the kitchen sink at the person. Okay, here's your diet. Here's how you sleep. Here's your workouts. Do it this way. You're going to walk this much. We're going to do mobility. And yep. it just doesn't work because it's too much all at once. 
And there's no way someone can go from doing nothing to all that on a consistent basis. Well, and it seems a lot of these physicians too, they, they find something like that that really has helped a lot of their patients, but then that becomes their first go-to and right. they jump past all these other yeah. uh, you know, protocols. Yeah, so you have to figure out as a trainer, like what Adam said, order operation. Okay, I know we're going to do one thing at a time. So let's start with this because this is the most impactful and it's probably one you can stick to. And then when you get that down, and what you're talking about is before you go and get this major face surgery, right, or then right. wouldn't it make sense Pretty to do invasive. like some physical therapy? Yes. So order operation is extremely important anytime you're helping anybody do anything, Huge. especially in medicine. So what have you, have you pieced, have you started to organize this and piece yes. together? And so, so that's what I've done in, in gut health care, which is, you know, we'll call in healthcare an algorithm. It's kind of like this cascade of decision trees start here. You know, if better, you're done. If not good, you can go here. And uh, then, you know, you just keep cascading down. And, and to your earlier comment, you start with the interventions that are least expensive, least invasive, and will help the most people. <laughs> Shocking, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then you, you proceed through. And also to your point of doing one thing at a time and, and to the order of operations, from each step you learn. You're not doing seven things, you're doing one thing. So the, mm. the person's response gives you valuable insight. That didn't work? Hmm, it could suggest this, or it did work. Hmm, it reinforces this. Right, and so there, you know, it's it's a little bit more tortoise, right? It's not like all this stuff out of the gate, but you actually cross the finish line much more quickly when you when you proceed that way, and you know that's some of these devices that I brought to kind of articulate this, which. Um, so you have this, yeah, let's start with the first one. Okay, so this is something you 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 put on your under your shirt, and there's a magnet. So essentially, you have this ball on your back that if while I'm in bed, if I roll over to it, I'm not going to want to lay on my back. It's exactly. going to feel uncomfortable or remind me to roll my side. What kind of success? First off, let's talk about sleeping on your back. How big of an impact does that have on uh, sleep quality or what you were saying? What was, was what, respiratory? Uh, what was the term? Respiratory used? events. Yeah. yeah. So, so how big of an impact is just sleeping on your back have on that? Well, what you'll see with either attended sleep studies or what we're using now, which is called the WatchPat One Home Sleep Test, it's essentially a, a watch-like device that's hooked up to a pulse oximeter that goes on your finger and a sticky note that goes on your chest to listen for respiration signs, snoring, and, and uh, apneic events where, where people stop breathing or are gasping for air. You get a report for how many of those events occur on the back, on the side, or when they're on, you know, oh, laying on their stomach. And there's a pretty strong correlation where the most of those events occur when you're on your back. And this is because if you think about all this musculature, the tongue and the throat muscles slough down into the oral airway when you relax in this position. Whereas if you're on your side, the tongue can't kind of slither back into the throat. Mm. Right. And this is part of what that myofunctional therapy does. Some of the exercises are just like you're calling a dog. Oh, okay. And it's just, you know, getting some tone in that musculature. Um, so I actually don't know how well studied this device has been, but I do know that I could start someone with this, right? Have them on a nightly basis wear this ring that tracks their oxygen levels and see if after a week their data improves. And if so, great. Maybe they don't have to do myofunctional therapy for a month mm. if this positional device suffices. So I don't know the actual stats on well, this. What is your experience? What have you seen anecdotally with your patients with, with just that? With this, there it's still a little bit hard for me to say because we've been, we're have been we still kind of mapping out the algorithm, so I don't want to speak too far outside of my clinical experience. We mm -hmm. have, I have, I'd say, six to eight patients right now who we have baseline WatchPat1 data on who are either using myofunctional therapy or a positional change device, and we're waiting to hear on them back. So far, two have reported back, and the two for two have almost experienced life-changing results. Just from that. Now, these were pretty well queued up, where one gentleman had severe apnea, and, and this is actually a pretty interesting story. He could not tolerate a CPAP. They say it can take a few weeks to kind of acclimate. Even after the acclimation period, he could just not sleep because it was too uncomfortable for him. So we then had him do myofunctional therapy, and within a month, his debilitating fatigue and brain fog started to clear. Wow. Now, it, it doesn't clear like that, right? Because you're talking about- Because you're building muscle yeah. or strength. Yeah. So it, yeah, it takes a little while, but he was you know, pretty much on the, uh, on the edge of like, man, I'm going to jump off a cliff here if something doesn't improve in my life. And uh, after about a month- He's like, yeah, I feel pretty much back to normal. Wow, that's mm. a, so. I know for me, um, I can't sleep on my back 
because if I do, my wife will punch me. Because literally, you I, snore. I, I 100% mm-hmm. right. on my, now I don't go. on my side. I don't sleep on my stomach because that's super uncomfortable, but I sleep on my side and on my back, 100%, I snore every single time. Yeah. So that so would make a So one other difference. thing that you just reminded me of this, I don't, I don't want to forget. I was going to bring this, it was kind of large. Um, there's one trial with this device. It's called the Smart Nora. It's a pillow that has a volume sensor and it will inflate so your head tips uh-huh. when you start snoring. <laughs> oh wow that's interesting, oh, interesting. So, that is very and i'm about to run an experiment with that myself just to see what kind of impact and i just came across that last week now, wait a minute is it recording like your your noises and sending it to some like tech company because i don't want to do it that's yeah. all yeah. of a sudden google's you know, what sort of profanities who, who you're cursing in your sleep <laughs> or is it whispering like you know to sell me shit at night no that sounds interesting so it picks up your sound and it causes you to, to yeah it to, just it just inflates the pillow so that it kind of pushes your head to the side now this magnetic kind of half ball thing cuz similar I, similar to that this is going to be the cheapest entry point i think this was like 20 bucks the smart nora is about 300 now where do you put this like right in your back you know on the t- like you said like on a t-shirt it attaches no no but where in, in the in, middle in of your back in between your shoulder blades okay yeah. okay so just to stop it to complete have you tried this I have not tried this yet, no. Oh, very, very interesting. Okay. Um, all right, what else? You, you showed me that ring. What does that ring yeah, do Yeah, so what's exactly? nice about this ring, because we want to be able to assess these things as best we can, but not make it super expensive. So someone could argue, well, if you think you have apnea, you should go into an overnight sleep study. Yeah. But if you don't have insurance, that can be at least $700, if not 1000 mm. And to get insurance to cover that sometimes it's just so much BS, mm-hmm. right? Where people give up after a while. The WatchPat One home sleep test or other similar home sleep tests give you proximal data. It's not going to be perfect, but it's enough to say, yeah, there's an issue here or no, there's not. And then this device, I think it's about $100. When you slide this on, it starts, it should turn on here. Yep. So this will assess your heart rate and your oxygen levels. And I sent you a picture of this. Um, if you guys want to include it in the notes. So right now I'm at 82 beats per minute. And I, I used this the other night where I had a bad night's sleep. Mm-hmm. What was so interesting about this was once your oxygen levels drop below, I believe it's 85%, that's fairly low. It's way lower than you want to be. Mm-hmm. The ring will buzz to wake you up, to pull you out of this How, How's event. it like sensing your oxygen levels? Infrared, right? I believe it's infrared. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, the, being Whatever able to, the standard pulse oximeter, I believe pulse oximeter- They've been around is, for a while. Is ultra, yeah. Yeah, that's what they're putting on people with uh, COVID. They're having them wear them okay. and just, just to measure yeah, their Yeah, because I just was, you know, the old, uh, I mean, you had to do that through blood, you know, the last time I- Right. Yeah. But, and, and these sleep studies, um, here, you know what turns me off about doing this? Because I probably have some form of sleep apnea. I've been told- by you know, my wife tells me if I've ever you and know. And so why don't you do anything? Yeah, okay, so yeah. here's so here's the thing. So it's two lazy. things that help me. <laughs> two things that help me. One is not sleeping on my back. Two is being lean. If I start to get heavy, it's not a supplement for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's why. If I start to get heavy, I can tell mm-hmm. um, that my sleep quality uh, kind of changes. But here's the other thing: to do a sleep study where you go to a lab, you got to go over there, spend the night, and don't they hook you up with a bunch of shit? How the hell are you gonna sleep anyway? Well, so I, I'm like, I, I, I did I'm, that. Of course, it's... I'm gonna have bad sleep. I got all these wires hooked up to me. And I'm sleeping in a weird room, knowing that they're watching me. <laughs> but yeah. you still, you still do get valuable data, even though, as I did, I slept like crap when I did it. And by the way, yeah, it's a ton. It's like 20 minutes of a tech just hooking wires up. And then they're like, "Go to sleep, relax." Yeah, yeah. and we're watching you. We'll just be watching. No <laughs> yeah, big deal. No yeah. thanks, but dude. when you, totally when you do have those short periods where you, you fall asleep, wood, it's, fine. It, it's that's what you're looking for. In those short windows where you do fall asleep, are there these you know frank apneic events? But you didn't want to do the sleep studies. Is that the main? That's it. It's just a yeah. pain in the ass. I'm, right. so I'm, this, that, this I'm the is, worst patient with this. I had a, cli- a really healthy client who just did this like a month ago and found out she had severe sleep apnea from it. Oh, she said mm-hmm. it was life-changing, right? Didn't yeah. she, she work so right here that she was really bad. And so you asked earlier, like, why are we doing this at the clinic or something to that effect? It's because there's a small subset of patients. We get their diet right, their lifestyle right. We clean up their gut health. And that's huge for a lot of people. But there's a subset where man, they still got some fatigue. They still have some mm-hmm. brain fog. They're not responding. What else is it? And one of the challenges in integrated medicine is there's so much lab and supplement company educational influence. So it's run this test. It could be MTHFR. Run this test. Wow. could be adrenal fatigue. And I found a lot of this stuff is crap, hmm. is legit not helpful. But this is an area where it's like, hmm, we know that sleep is hugely impactful. And we know that when we fix problems with apneas, hugely impactful. But people don't want to go in and do the overnights, and people don't want to use the CPAP. 
but there's all these other things. So another device here, this mouth guard, I'll take it out. I'll take it out in a second. Okay. Um, it's called a mandibular advancement device. So it's like a mouth guard that it brings the lower push, jaw pushes forward. your jaw forward. And if you sit up real straight, yeah, can you hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's how yeah. Adam breathes all the time. Yeah, so that's nice. see, that's why the audience I do that in the, me. In, the, yeah. in the microphone. It's but, that guy yeah, over there. But p- part of this is, is pretty endemic in Western cultures. It's kind of the the Western A price facial development due to nutritional insufficiencies, and the jaw may not form forward enough. So this device has also been shown to be similarly effective as CPAP, and it's just a mouth guard. Hmm. So this is what I'm so excited about the clinic where. I didn't know this six months ago, but there are all these things that can be done that are about as effective as CPAP. And now the people who are suspected to have a sleep problem, but are like, I don't want to be a Frankenstein every night with that thing in my mouth. Like there's options for them. This has been my fight. Yeah. The whole time my dad was like raving about his CPAP because once he, he started to use it, it's like, it was life changing for him a lot like your clients, but like for him, he had chronic acid reflux and had all these gut problems forever. And all of a sudden it was like an overnight thing where he didn't have those issues. And I thought that was really interesting. And uh, he was trying to sell me on it, but I'm like, I'm not going to be hooked up to a Darth Vader mask the rest yeah. of my life. You'll never have sex again. That's how I yeah. feel. Like, oh, honey, let's <laughs> go to bed. traveling with that thing. Yeah. Like, no thanks. Yeah. So, okay. So, this so, is very interesting here. So, what you're seeing here, these bands want to pull. Uh, actually, it would be this way. Sorry. So, this is a top jaw, and this band is pulling the bottom jaw forward. Oh. And so, that little bit of room now clears that. Just a little bit of resistance pulling the lower... <laughs> Can you hear now, that have you tried this? Into I have. And how does it feel to wear that? I don't love the way this feels, mm. right? But this is relative to doing nothing, right? So mm. if this is relative to CPAP, probably okay. But this is what's been so insightful about doing this, which is, okay, if you have someone who's like, Doc, I'm just so overwhelmed, I can't do 10 minutes of myofunctional therapy per day. Okay, then we'll give you a mouth guard, mm. right? So we, we can kind of personalize it to the individual, right? Like the type A who's like, exercises? Sure, I love exercises. Yeah, I'll yeah, do it. Yeah. Great, myofunctional therapy. For the person who's like, man, I got a kid. I'm super busy. I'm barely like getting wear by. This. Wear this until things open up, and then we'll go back to the now, Is that an therapy. expensive device? This is, is it... about $400. Okay. So it's not terribly expensive, but- it's also not ten dollars like the positional change. Well, maybe. I want to know. So you're you're just now starting this, so you haven't had an opportunity to really test this because I'd be curious to see the the patterns that you find. Like, uh, what type of client? Like, can I visually tell? Like, mm-hmm. oh, this yep. person's like really obese. This tool will probably help them the most. Mm-hmm. Or if this mm-hmm. person's got, they're in great shape, so maybe it has more to do with their jaw. Right. Like, you haven't seen that yet, have you? Been able well, to tease some so of that stuff one out. One of the things I try to do is really look at. Our, our initial intake paperwork and try to tie that to these interventions. And there are certain things that flag in, in paperwork. So if people have fatigue that's unresponsive to anything else, that's one flag. Because a lot of the patients will see, they're pretty savvy with health, right? They're not coming in like drinking Slurpees and smoking cigarettes. Like yeah. they do paleo, they do CrossFit. They're, right. you know, they're pretty well to do. And if there's still fatigue there, that's one flag. If they had a history of braces or headgear, that's another flag. Because braces and headgear oftentimes pull everything back. Oh, because right? you, you want aesthetics, but it's not necessarily... Yeah. To straighten the teeth, they pull things back rather than opening up the oral airway. So braces, headgear is another. And then snoring, dry mouth, or drool on the pillow. These are all also flags. Man, I got like four of those that you just... Right. Yeah. <laughs> He's a big drooler. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you look at those and you say, okay, does this person also have irritable bowels and... Am I suspecting that they have a lot of histamine? Meaning if your gut's really inflamed, there's a lot of histamine that's a byproduct of all that inflammation Mm -hmm. and immune activity. And when someone has a lot of inflammation and histamine, it can cause their nasal passageway to get a little bit more inflamed and stuffy. Oh, sure. Right? Sure. So it's like, okay, like this is probably not necessarily a structural issue. It's probably inflammatory. So we'll start with going through the gut algorithm and then reassess, but we'll have queued up in our problems list. We go to the structural issues next if the gut work doesn't reduce the sleep, you know, the, 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 what we're suspecting to be a sleep impediment. Mm. So we are starting to see some of these things kind of, um, you know, uh, in terms of what are the early warning signs to, to how they map on. You, you know, what's treatment. interesting about some of the stuff that you're, you're bringing out here when you're talking about uh, diet and exercise, which are the other pillars, right? Exercise oftentimes requires, okay, there's lots of movement pattern, exercise programming. We got to make sure we do the work, right workout. Oh, you got to be consistent with it. It's not something you could just put on. 
and it's going to help. You actually have to go and participate in right. it. So there's that challenge. But that's easier than diet. Diet's even harder. Diet is really complicated, especially when you include the psychology of the person that you're working with, what kind of attachments they have with food, how they value food. Do they self-medicate with it? This is obviously something we worked with for years with clients. Very challenging. You know, As a trainer, much easier to get somebody to be consistent with exercise, which is hard, than diet, which is even harder. But what you're showing here is pretty cool because – and I'm not saying – you know, fixing subtle sleep issues is necessarily easy. However, when you're talking about putting something on your shirt or wearing a mouth guard and that makes a difference, like that doesn't happen with exercise and diet. And yet improving your sleep will have just as big of an impact on your health. So and listening to this is actually getting me kind of excited because I know I have issues yeah, with sleep. Same. And I don't want to do <laughs> I don't want to do the sleep study. I don't want it's a pain in the yeah. ass or whatever. I we'll know I sound you, like we'll a send jerk. you a watch pat one. Okay. All right. And one night it's it's like I think $150 to do the test. You wear a watch one night and you have baseline data. Wow. And then we can monitor you with this guy right here, which I think is $150. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm excited about that we're figuring out in the clinic. Like we don't have to say, do a overnight sleep study and then do another one after six weeks. Right? Cause like, who's going to do that? Mm -hmm. It's just not practical. Uh, are you noticing any connections to uh, things that people use commonly to help them sleep? Melatonin, uh, I've marijuana. seen people, not to cut you up, but on that one, I've seen some people who are using way too high of a dose of melatonin. The, the 10 milligram dosing I've noticed makes some people sleep worse. So mm -hmm. I think people should be careful not to go much above maybe three milligrams. But I also don't know if people have good sleep hygiene, meaning they have a good pre-bed routine, wind down, redu reduction of light and stimulation. Which is rare, by the way. They, yeah, they, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't be needing melatonin outside of a rare occasion. Mm. And it doesn't have to be an intense, like two hour wind down. But I will say, if you can watch the sunset, this is something I've been doing up in Walnut Creek a few nights per week. I'll um, sauna, eat, and then I'll walk up to this hilltop and watch the sunset. You want to talk about a great way just to feel phenomenal and like your head's clear and see your sleep scores jump and your readiness scores jump. It's that little bit of time, mm. honestly. Are you noticing with your with some of your patients when they improve their sleep? Uh, Justin brought up his dad had um, acid reflux that went away. Are you noticing things that normally we wouldn't connect to poor sleep improve, like infl inflammation, joint I don't, pain? I don't see as much of the, the gut specifically because we're going to be addressing a lot of that stuff early in our kind of therapeutic algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if there is a whole array of, of non-responsive symptoms that you'll see respond because coming back to the earlier point where I said there was meta-analyses on IBD, IBS, all these different things that improve or correlate with poor sleep, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't think that there's anything that couldn't potentially respond. Okay. So you show, so, so the ring, you showed this ball, this mouthpiece, which is, I see some tape. Is that something yeah, else? So mouth taping is something that can be done. Well, we should do this with Sal for sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you beat me yeah, to the job. This is a sexy <laughs> option right here. Just, yeah. You just take a piece of I'm just tape. trying to help you sleep, Sal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just the shh. Right there. Uh, I'm Italian. I got my hands. So this is, good for, this is good for relationships too. This is as good as, as a therapist. <laughs> um, you you just put a piece of tape over your lips at night, and it discourages mouth breathing. And for some people, they will not revert to mouth breathing if there's that resistance there. They'll nasal breathe, which is better for respiration at night. I've seen this help people maybe 15, 20% of the time. It's not huge. Mm. And I do think there's a number of people who are using mouth taping where it's not doing anything, but because there's a, a lot of buzz right now about mouth taping. I've seen it on the Instagram post. Do it. People like yeah. the shoulder face. You know, I use, uh, um, freak me I use those nasal pathways to encourage that like if i the, sure. the ones that have like the aloe yep. vera or whatever in them yep if i wear that it encourages me to breathe through my nose because if i'm at all in the slightest bit congested i won't breathe through sure. my nose and i breathe through my mouth and i notice better quality sleep just from that now so. what about combinations what about okay i'm going to use this ball the mouthpiece yeah and definitely then. so if someone's wearing this mandibular advancement device they might be a little bit more prone to mouth breathe so you have them put in the mouth guard and then mouth tape Oh, that, wow. Right. That's right. Okay. So, and this is where just some personalization and and having some data like this night over night ring score. And I'm trying to have most patients pair this with an aura ring, just so I have two different ways of looking at the data. They they do give you different scores. Um, 
but you're looking for things to improve because the other side of this coin is you don't want someone doing a bunch of stuff to making it worse or, or, <laughs> or just like having no benefit. Right, right. Right. I didn't notice with mouth taping, my aura ring scores changed at all. So I stopped mouth taping. And I think that's another important part of this equation, which is we don't want to do everything we can do kind of to your earlier point about as a trainer, you don't do like seven things at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if it's not working, we don't necessarily need to have them keep doing it. Hmm. Yeah, I know uh, Doug wore a device that measured his sleep, but it actually, just wearing the device decreased it, the sleep quality. It was, <laughs> it was the aura ring. It was when it, we yeah. all got the aura yeah. rings and he, he stopped, he stopped using it because he got, it, made, it made him anxious. Hmm. Oh, I got to get better sleep. Yeah. Oh, I got to look at my reading or whatever. So that's, that's I mean, something to pay attention yep. to, right? Yeah, And that's where if someone's really anxious, then I might say, okay, we're not going to do this nightly. We're just going to do that overnight watch pat one home test mm -hmm. at day one and then at week six. Yeah. And give them less data to kind of work themselves up with. Because, yeah, know, it's, a, it's a good point. You know what's interesting about just because I've looked into sleep apnea because I'm sure I have some level of it. Uh, heart disease, stroke, heart attack, cancer risks all go up. From having uh, oh yeah poor sleep, which is it's kind of yep. scary. To, you know, and see. obesity is another one that I haven't dug deeply enough to see where the majority of the data are on this chicken or the egg, because mm -hmm. there is a chicken or the egg, right? If you're overweight, you're more likely to have apnea, but if you have apnea, are you more likely to gain weight? It's probably both. Oh, good, I'd, good point. Because I'd be I'd be shocked if apnea didn't lead to weight gain to some degree, mm -hmm. especially because of the overeating. So totally. Yeah. Piece. Well, like like Sal, I've been kind of avoiding this whole topic because of the you know the options were not too attractive. Right. But I actually found some. There was some information out there that the didgeridoo. Yes, uh, actually you helped in terms yes. of like yeah, like so what? exercising the muscles there. You know, the, you know that the, the didgeridoo, didgeridoo is what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. You know that sounds one, like something from Doctor Seuss. No, 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 it's a, it's the instrument that wow, uh, yeah, Aborigines wow, will use wow. in in uh, Australia. Uh, Australian uh, you've yeah. seen that, right? Remember yeah. crocodile, crocodile Dundee? Dundee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. another great point. So there's that study and another study that found that singers have less OSA or obstructive sleep apnea, and that's another layer of intervention that we can you know, consider having people start with, which would be, okay, you're, you don't want to do myofunctional therapy. Didgeridoo is another thing that we have built into our algorithm where when you have the discussion, okay, here's what we found. Here's your options. Here's what I'd recommend based upon your personality, which would be, you know, if you're someone that can't meditate, doesn't want to sit still, always wants to do something, mm -hmm. learn didgeridoo, right? If like yeah. doing the exercises seems too boring to doing you. Doing something's easier for some people. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Wow. And, that, and that's like the art of medicine, right? Which is having all these different things and rather than saying, well, the test showed this, so you must do that, the test showed this. And so there's a few different ways we can achieve the that that we're looking for. And we're going to be a little bit open-minded and flexible. And I'm not going to say, well, there's more data on myofunctional therapy, so you've got to do that. And you can't do didgeridoo because I'm evidence-based. Like I really believe in being very evidence-informed, but not evidence-limited. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, didgeridoo. <laughs> there it is. Let's do some speculating. I know you hate this. You're, you're super, you're incredible integrity. So every time we ask you to speculate, you're always like, well, I can't give you an answer because I yeah. looked at studies, but we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. What <laughs> <laughs> we're going to put you on the spot. Do yeah. we, okay, we always hear about how much worse sleep is today. Oh, so there's this huge epidemic of poor sleep and people aren't sleeping well. Is that true or is it just that we're more aware or is it, or is modern life in our lifestyle contributing to poor sleep? Or is it, again, is it just awareness? Well, um, Certainly, I think there's a lot of plausibility to the argument that with lighting and the ability to just skew your circadian rhythm to however you want, that yeah, our, our sleep to an extent is almost for certain worse than it used to be because a few hundred years ago, you couldn't be watching the television at night in a brightly lit home at like midnight. All right, so there was natural factors that kind of encouraged us, encouraged us sorry, to, to have that day-night circadian rhythm. And that is huge. That's another thing that's been found in the literature, which is you could have eight or nine hours of sleep and it's self-reportedly re refreshing. But if you're a night shift worker, all cause mortality, death many cause goes up. Oh yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that. Yeah. So, so, so some of these are easy to say yes to. And then I think Matthew Walker's done a good job of exposing how caffeine too late in the day can decrease REM and deep sleep. So with, you know, the overuse of caffeine or using caffeine too late in the day, plus the devices and bright light at night, plus our lifestyle is just being so much more kind of hamster wheel on the internet rather than... Low level constant stress. Yeah. 
So yeah, I think it's pretty fair to say our sleep is worse than it was before. I think some people take it too far and they're trying to become almost exactly like a hunter gatherer. Like I've heard about some people because I think it was Aborigines that, that found that it got colder into the middle of the night and then it warmed up. Yeah. They try to set their thermostat to like replicate that you know, oscillation and temperature. That's all fine and good, but that just seems like a bridge too far. Mm. Whereas these things are probably more squarely hitting what most people need. Dude, I ha- so we work with a company called uh, Chili, right? So they make these chili pads. Yeah, okay, so trip off this, right? So there's a, there's a function on there where you can have it warm up like to start to warm up, up. Yeah. about an hour. Be- so here's what I did. And this was a game changer for me. I have this alarm clock that doesn't like just jar you awake. It slowly glows and it simulates like sunrise. the sun rising. Yeah. And I paired that with the Uller, which is one of the chili, chili products that starts to warm up. And I wake up like I'm not getting woken up by an alarm clock. I kind of like just great. Yeah. Which is, you know, kind of cool. So, and I'm all for those things, but if you're doing that, before addressing potential apnea, totally. There's been a really like inverted uh, order of operations. Yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Okay, um, what about men versus women? Is it because you said that men tend to have more of these kind of this respiratory issues? Is it generally that men have worse sleep, or is it the other way around? Are there other factors? Well, uh, again, I don't know all the nuances of this body of literature, but it probably predominantly due to the fact that men have more muscle mass, men have more snoring and more apnea. So this is is something that skews toward men. Yeah, that's the stereotype, right? That the guys are the ones that are snoring and stuff like that. Hormonal issues. uh, Do we see it affect hormones in men? Low testosterone, higher cortisol. I'm glad glad you asked this. So there are some clinics that they do two things, sleep assessments and testosterone monitoring because there's such a tight correlation between poor sleep and lower testosterone. Oh, wow. Now, how much you can move the needle with that I've yet to see. So as you may know, I'm, I'm very circumspect, right? And I uh, try to be careful about, well, there was one study that found in mice that when we stopped interrupting the mice's sleep, their testosterone increased by 200%. Okay, great. Let's open a clinic. Mm-hmm, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, that's maybe going a little bit too far. But it does make sense that you'd see perturbations, suboptimization in testosterone in men who have apnea. I'm just, I haven't seen yet whether you're going to talk about like how big a 50-point jump, a 200-point jump. And I haven't dug into the literature yet to see, but I'm assuming what I'll find when I do that is there's at least some preliminary evidence showing a meaningful improvement in testosterone when you get rid of an apnea. Okay. I want to go back to caffeine. You mentioned caffeine, and I know this is something that you're you know, somewhat well-versed in because you, um, uh, you know, obviously when it comes to gut health, when it comes to... Um, you know, helping someone with their hormones. I know you look at caffeine quite often. Now, we're, we t- it looks like we're in this culture of caffeine nowadays. When we were all kids, obviously, we didn't drink coffee. That's what teachers and adults drank. <laughs> right. Now, caffeine seems to be consumed uh, by everybody. I think the only time I had caffeine would be I drink a Coca Cola or something like that. Right. Um, and I noticed, and also we see lots of studies be- touting the the benefits of caffeine. Um, you know, it helps with. Brain health, it, it's good for insulin sensitivity, good for athletic performance, blah, blah, blah. I know as a trainer, there's a huge individual variance and some people do poorly with caffeine. Do, do you, Can you give like a general guideline? Like what is the, the doses that you tend to see with your patients that tends to be okay and what tends to be too much? Well, I, I don't get Where's that granular with, with monitoring their dose. but and, and we just wrote an article on this. So if people search my name and caffeine, they should be able to find this review because it is an important point, and there are some that have said, you know, there's certain compounds in coffee, and therefore you shouldn't drink it. And, you know, I don't mean to keep kind of beating on this drum, but this is why levels of evidence is so important. Right? There, there's this one blog out there that, that got some attention because this blogger referenced a mechanism that coffee impacts that's pro-inflammatory or something like that. If you weigh that against the meta-analyses that have found coffee is neutral to beneficial for metabolism, for cognitive health. Um, Pretty much the data shows coffee, the high quality data, meaning, you know, not the mechanism and then we speculate, but what happens when we look at free living humans who are either doing this or not doing this, you see neutrality to benefit with coffee with one or two small caveats that are probably more so situational, which would be reflux, IBS, especially diarrheal IBS. But once you improve the health of the gut, then I don't find those conditions to be provocated by caffeine. Um, so the dose is another good question. 
I think there was a good article, I believe it was with examine.com. And I think they found that it was either 200 or, or 250 milligrams was kind of this cutoff point, which kind of resonated with me where I'll find, you know, if I go beyond six shots of espresso in a day, that's when I start to feel a little bit jittery mm -hmm. and like I have less energy. So I think everyone's going to be a little bit different. Um, listening to that person's body is probably the best way to suss that out. Once you have them where they're more tolerant and that's where if someone does have a sensitive gut, caffeine can be a little bit stimulatory, potentially a little bit noxious, but getting their gut soothed and healed, then they should be able to tolerate that just like anybody else. I notice my caffeine tolerance is way different when my gut is healthy. Yeah, like when I, when it's off, uh, two, 150 to 200 milligrams, I can get anxious. Yep. When my gut is good, 400 milligrams, and okay. I'm having a great workout. So that's why the gut is the foundation of what I do because it's so so important. Yeah. So so but but so you're saying now though, sleep is something that you're starting to include, and with these people that you're in, including working on this, it's been pretty profound. Then it has, and I'm I'm actually really excited because so coming back to my story, when I as a patient went into the world of sleep medicine, it was crazy. It was surgery as one option, and then the other I didn't have a chance to tell you about was this essentially an expansive retainer that I'm sure would work, but I would need six months of braces to re-straighten my teeth after wearing this. And, and <laughs> that seems like, you know, if that's my only option, wow. right, maybe. But it just baffled me that some of these other therapeutics weren't offered up. And so that's why I took it upon myself to put together the sleep algorithm at the clinic because no one else is doing it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm quite excited about it. Oh, that's good. Well, yeah. I'm glad I'm glad you brought this and showed us because I we're always for things that are less invasive, less intrusive, a little easier, less expensive that have a good impact before moving into some of the bigger stuff. And uh, I'm excited to now. Try would you ever myself. check these things before you do the gut stuff, or you always do go into the gut first and then do this? Well, I mean, it would it would depend if someone had some pretty severe flags where there was severe dry mouth, severe fatigue, severe snoring, a family history of apnea. Maybe they had a sleep study like two years ago and it diagnosed apnea, but they never wanted to try the CPAP because they were scared. Yeah. Then that might be, okay, let's do these kind of in tandem. Yeah. So it would, it would depend. Certainly, I'm never going to force a gut solution upon someone, but just yeah. knowing how pivotally and foundationally important gut health is, it's always going to be a thought. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering right now as we're talking, I'm, I'm, my wheels are spinning. Um, it, it, it could, poor sleep could affect motility, right? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. would then potentially increase your risk for things like SIBO. Yeah. And this is why we, we see poor sleep increasing IBS prevalence. And I'm assuming once the research gets a little bit more sophisticated and they're saying is that IBS along with SIBO, we'll probably find that as the research has shown, maybe around 40 to 50% of IBS cases are underlied by SIBO. Wow. All right. Very fascinating. Well, cool stuff. I'm glad you brought yeah. this stuff. And no, th thanks. this is something that for sure people watching right now can implement for pretty inexpensive. I'm personally going to try, I want to do the ring and I, uh, I might try the mouthpiece is one of the things I'd like to try, but I'll talk to you and you see what you Yeah, we can me. get you guys lined up and yeah, it'll be we'll interesting to kind of look at you guys as the tip of the spear from the uh, athletic, you know, performance, uh, cohort to see how much this has to benefit someone who's really got everything else dialed in. Yeah, I predict the three of us, just the three hosts here have terror. I guarantee oh, you're, you're yeah. going to see us all. I'm sure high. it's underlying. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, well, I, I've shared I already know guys. I'm a back sleeper and I know I've had to do things where I put like on my nose to get me in a breeze so I sleep mm. better. So and are you a light sleeper? Are you guys generally light sleepers? Are you deep sleepers? You know, um, I used to, uh, now that I have kids, I guess I'm probably a light. It depends on the sound that I hear, but I, right. I'll pop up right away. Right. So I don't know I'm if that has to do like with light. being, yeah. say what? I say I, I'm out like a light. Oh, yeah. Right. Just, yeah. yeah no. So I, I would say I'm probably a light sleeper now. Okay. I don't know. Is there a correlation to that? I mean, have you noticed? I don't know. That, that's what I'm trying. That's what I'm, I'm asking because I'm trying to learn uh, what okay. the correlation is between, between the two. I've yeah. always been a light sleeper myself, but I'm not sure if that's just constitution or if that's a flag. They, they do say that teeth grinding or bruxism is one red flag that you have a, a problem with, with uh, apnea also. Um, I can fall yeah, asleep great. anywhere at any time. I feel like that's a red flag. I should not be able to fall I'm asleep whenever I want. All my <laughs> yes, that, that so, is definitely a red flag. Yeah. Daytime sleepiness. There's a, I think it's called the Epley um, questionnaire. And it, it's one of the kind of peer-reviewed validated sleep questionnaires. But I, I find it's a little bit too, 
you have to be a little bit too severe to fully flag on it. And that's why we've built in some of those other things. Like it's weird mouth. how he does it though, because I feel like he's got really good energy and mood right. is consistent and well. And then, but yet if we get on a plane before it even takes off, he's out. Or if we get in a car <laughs> and go drive cars. somewhere, he's asleep before we get around the corner. This is Sal. Yeah. 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 Consistently. Yeah. yeah so but that it, might be just all, you know, firstly, I'm assuming pretty strong baseline constitution mm -hmm. and then all these other excellent health practices. But to your other point, maybe that word recall and that, that next level of cognition mm -hmm. is really what's going to open up for you. Yeah. And I'm also one of those people that if I get a little tired, it makes me more wired. And so it might come across as, oh, yeah. he's energetic right now. But in reality, I'm fried. But that depth of thinking, and this is something I've noticed, totally. my depth of thinking has gotten so much more profound. Mm. It's re And especially now that the clinic is growing and we're pioneering some research initiatives and there's multiple people. Um, I really have to have that kind of deep thinking where you're looking at all these complex gear wheels and how they kind of fit together. And I don't think I could be doing this if I didn't have the sleep that I have now because it's like five years ago it was more workhorse. Just get the stuff done. Just grind. Right, yeah. yeah. But now grinding doesn't get me any farther. It's that very deep, insightful thinking. I was listening to a um, lecture with Jeff Bezos and he said, I am paid a lot of money to make very few but very important decisions. And I think that's the evolution of most entrepreneurs. You want to get to that point where it's not like hamster wheel, like grinding. It's now you're kind of sitting atop, like the Ray Dalio principles book mm -hmm. recommends, you know, you're sitting atop of this complex machine and you're giving these very strategic inputs. So there's not a lot of decisions, but the ones that you do make are so, so important. Yeah. They can go one way in a big way or the other way in a big way. Exactly. Excellent. Well, and uh, sorry, I don't want to catch, but I don't, just want to speak to the females for a moment that females will have hormonally associated sleep problems, obviously, if they're having hot flashing. And I just want to mention to women that there are herbal options that can help to balance out female hormones like Don Kwai and black cohosh. Mm. So there are options there for women who might say, well, I don't want to go on hormone replacement therapy. It scares me. Okay. Understandable. I think with a low dose that can be done pretty darn safely, especially if it's bioidentical, but there are also herbal options for women who might be. And what are those two again in it? Black cohosh? Uh, black cohosh. And Don Kwai, I use a formula called Estro Harmony, mm -hmm. which has a kind of co combination of those with, with white peony and licorice as just one option. But for women, if you're feeling that warmth at night, then uh, and you're you know getting to your, I'd say anywhere from your mid 30s onward is when it may start flagging. What's that one supplement? I think it's it's a vi it cuts with a V. Vitex. Vitex. Yep. Thank you very much. So also may help, but Vitex is more so something that will help spur natural production of progesterone. But the, the challenge with Vitex is it works in the brain as a dopamine agonist, meaning it helps agonize dopamine, which you want. Stress can kind of tear down or, or use up dopamine. And dopamine in the brain, it, it's known as a tonic inhibitor of prolactin. So if dopamine goes low in a roundabout way, your prolactin goes high, and that thwarts the ability of the brain to signal the ovaries to make progesterone. Got it. But when you're postmenopausal, that communication from the brain to the ovaries is kind of shut down. So, so chase tree or Vitex doesn't work in a menopausal cohort because it goes through the brain, and that brain access is a waste of time. So, yeah, if you're if you're premenopausal, then chase tree can be helpful. But if you're postmenopausal, you either want to use the estrogen modulators like black cohosh and don Kwai or a low dose bioidentical HRT. Mm, excellent. Oh, well, cool. This has been very informative, and I'm I'm excited to try this out. So I'll give people an update on how this affected my Sweet. sleep. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks. Right on, man.